So as many of you know, they have come down from the mountain. <laughs> Not as Moses, but as time spent out in, in Colorado in the mountains. There's a journey that I have planned for some time. I was looking through Facebook one day, and I saw something that just caught my eye. There's an advertisement. Altar fly fishing. Not altar like change, but altar like you go to worship. And I read up on it. And this particular ad was for a ministry specific to pastors. They do a lot of different retreats for people. They do like a father and son. They do a ladies only. They do veterans. They do all this. And it's a Christian organization that is just the, the, the thing that ties them together, no pun intended, is fly fishing. And this particular retreat was called Soul of the Pastor. Or Soul of the Pastor. And as I read up on it, I joked around with Adrian, hey, wouldn't this be cool? Because I saw the price. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that'd be really cool, but... And she's like, you should go. I'm like, ah, I don't know. You should go. God will work it out. If it's meant to be, God will work it out. And so I made some calls to the organization, and they're like, no, 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 Listen, if you need to be here, we'll figure it out. And so they brought the price down for me because of some generous donors. And so I was able to go out there. They believe wholeheartedly in helping pastors out. Because pastors, they burn out quick. See, our soul is something pretty unique. The Holy Spirit is to pour into us so that we can then pour out onto others as well. And pastors spend so much time pouring into others. And sometimes they don't spend enough time pouring into themselves. And I found myself kind of burning out of sorts. And I needed to be poured into by some people to help me. And so I journeyed out west to do some fly fishing and to be poured into. But the one thing I've learned in my journey as a Christian is I've learned a little bit about myself. And that's something that sometimes we don't spend enough time doing, is learning about ourselves and who we are as a created being in Christ and how God made each of us so unique and different. See, what pours into you, what rejuvenates you, what refuels you is probably something different than me. And some of you might connect in this way and some of you might not. But for me, it's being just in the creation. It's being out in the woods. It's being out in the mountains, in the fresh air. It's just being out. And all I can say is, it's just a matter of being. That's the only thing that I wanted to do was to go out west and just be. I don't know if that was just be still and know that he is God. To just be in his presence. To just be there existing. I don't know what that meant, but that was like the theme for me this whole trip was to just be. And I found out that it was, I needed to be poured into more than I ever realized. And so my journey started after service just a couple Sundays ago. And uh, I left and went up through the UP, because who wants to drive through Chicago traffic and all that mess? Especially if you love creation. I mean, we have great architecture and buildings, and it's, it's some amazing stuff to see, but that's, that's not me. So I went up through the UP, and I was able to catch up with the, with the friend up there. The first night I stayed with him, we, we went out, we did some fishing. That's what pours into me. We did some, did some fishing. And it was great. And the next day we went out and we did some more fishing. We went out in the morning and until early afternoon or so. And this river was, was cool. We followed this electrical line to this bridge and we jumped into the river down, down at the bottom of the bridge there, and we walked for a couple miles in the river. We caught some fish, not a whole lot. It didn't matter. 
was just busy being. And then we hopped out of the out of the river and went through some swampy stuff and up a hill and found some train tracks, abandoned train tracks. He knew that they were there, and that was our way back to the truck. And these abandoned train tracks are pretty awesome because they were so overgrown. There were spots where you couldn't stay between the, the narrow rails. There's the tag elders and stuff had just grown up that much that you had to get off the rails and kind of go around, and that got to be pretty wild and crazy at times. And then we could get back onto the rails. It was there that I picked up, these aren't the, the ones that I've got them at home, but I picked up three railroad spikes like this for my son, just to say, hey, I'm thinking of you on my trip. And so I picked those railroad spikes up and I put them in the truck and we made our way back to his house and we visited for a while longer and then I kept on my journey because that wasn't my final destination. I wanted to go out to the mountains. I wanted to have that Moses type experience to be there in the mountains and that's what I had, this vision of finding this great giant boulder and just sitting on this boulder and just existing with God. But I was still in Michigan so I had to journey through Wisconsin, and journey through Minnesota, I found myself in Minneapolis stopping at a Cabela's because that's what outdoors guys do, right? <laughs> Stopped at Cabela's and looked for some stuff and didn't find it. No big deal. And I found a Chick-fil-A. I don't get enough Chick-fil-A because I'm in northern Michigan or central Michigan and even north. I don't get Chick-fil-A enough. And I found a Chick-fil-A. So I had some Chick-fil-A and I'm like, hey, it's getting kind of late because this is dinner time. And where am I going to stop? And so I'm looking at my phone and trying to figure out where I can stop. I'm camping in my truck. Literally, I've made a bed platform to live in my truck on this journey. It was great. At least for me. Some of you are like, that's crazy. For me, it was what my heart desired. And so I looked and I'm like, hey, I can make it to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I can see the falls lit up at night. If you've never done that, it is absolutely amazing. They've got these giant LED lights that illuminate the falls. And it was Beautiful. The park closes at midnight. I make it there at 11.30, and it was the coolest thing. And at half an hour or so before they closed the park, I didn't want to get a ticket. I don't know if they get tickets. but So I'm like, I better find a place to sleep. And so I find a place to pull the truck over and sleep. And I didn't sleep very good because apparently I brought a tick from northern Michigan with me in the truck and I felt it crawling on me. I freaked out. And so I couldn't sleep very well and there I was like so agitated. I'm like, I just got to keep driving. If I can't sleep, I might as well drive. And so I drove a couple hours. I pulled over. I slept a couple more hours once I calmed down and then I kept driving. And going through Kansas and going through Nebraska and that. I kept finding myself paralleling these railroad tracks. And it's really cool because you'd come across these little towns. And these towns were always based on these silos that were there, these farm co-ops. I mean, we here in Coleman, we get that. We've got some silos over there. This co-op, they bring their grain, they bring their, their corn, whatever it is, right? And these little towns, sometimes as small as like 30 people. 38 people is the smallest population I saw of a town that was based around these co-ops. And sometimes they're up to about 400 or so. But it had everything to do with these narrow train tracks. Eventually the train tracks kind of stopped and I made my way up to Colorado. I went to the retreat and they just poured into me more than I could take in at the time. Just three days with them. We did some fishing. Every day we did some fishing. Man, one day was like a rodeo. Like literal white water rafting while fishing. It was crazy. Hold on like this and start whipping a fly rod all over and it looked like a rodeo star. Class three, class four, rapids. Man, that's what poured into me. It was cool. The third day we, we climbed up a mountain. We jumped in these old antique vehicles. I was in like a 1977 International Scout Traveler, if anyone has a car aficionado and that. And it was in pretty good shape, and I see a couple smiles. We climbed up this mountain road in this Traveler until it couldn't make it any further. And then we hiked the rest of the way up to this high mountain lake, did some more fishing, got caught in a crazy 
lightning and thunderstorm up there where it just torrential downpoured on us with lots of hail. Lightning and hail, that's a fun one when you're waving a graphite rock around in the air on top of a mountain. That was the last day of fishing. And the next day we had to, had to part ways. There on the mountain I had met some new friends. Friends that I'm going to stay in contact with. Friends that are praying for me. Friends that I am now praying for. As we all came kind of broken of sorts, most of us. Some of us were in pretty decent spots in life. But they still understood that they needed to take care of their soul as well. And so I talked to one of the local guys, and I'm like, hey, I know that it's 4th of July weekend, and this is going to be a tall order, but where can I go to get away from the crowd? And they told me, go up such and such a road. Go past this, this lake, follow this creek, and keep going up the mountain. Eventually, the crowd will dissipate, and you'll find your spot. So I go up the, up the mountain, there's so many people camping, pulled off on the sides of the road. I'm like, I gotta keep going. And the road got a little bit rougher. And there's fewer and fewer people camping. And then there's this sign that says limited dispersed camping. Dispersed camping is like basically camping on Bureau of Land Management or National Forest Ground where you can just camp along the side of the road as long as you're off the road, free of charge, but there's no amenities, there's no no porta potty, there's no shower, there's no nothing. It's, it's rustic as rustic can get. And there's still people, and so I went further up the road, and I'm like, well, I got a truck, I got four wheel drive, and man, I hope I don't get into some stuff like we got on that one fishing trip. But I made my way, and then off to the side, I see this giant boulder, and I'm like, that's. That's like the boulder that I had in this vision of being there on the mountain alone with God. I'm like, I gotta check this out. So I pull the truck over and I start walking. As I walk up to the boulder, I see that this outcropping goes out a little bit further. And it just kind of dead cliffs off. And what I thought I was looking at, little miniature trees were just the tops of trees because from the edge where I could sit and dangle my feet over this cliff were trees way down there. And it was great because all I could hear was the sound of rushing water in this creek. And I sat there for a while. I found a rock, by the way. I'll tell you about that some other time. But God spoke to me. Isn't it amazing how God can speak to each individual? When an individual takes some time to understand their soul and how God made them and what they need, how he can pour into them if we put ourselves in those opportunities. And so I stayed there and I just kind of took it in a little bit. And I spent a couple days camping there. I spent another day hiking three miles up a mountain 1,500 foot ascent up to another mountain lake. And it was a lot of work. I tell you what, I don't know how Moses did it. Like, I had a trail that was hard enough, and I'm thinking Moses didn't have a trail to follow. He just, he went up that mountain on his own like a billy goat. And he was older than I was, and I'm kind of put off by that. Of sorts. So I did some fishing, and somewhere in the early afternoon, I just felt like it was enough. So I took the hike back down, got in the truck, and instead of turning right to go back to my campground or campsite, I, I took a left to go further up the mountain. I found myself at the Continental Divide, popular place. Cottonwood Pass, Continental Divide. There's lots of pull-offs at the Continental Divide. But I was at Cottonwood Pass. Cars were parked all over, and there's a spot where there's still some snow. I mean, we're above 12,000 feet at this point, and there's still some snow. So on July 4th, here I am in my sandals, taking the obligatory picture selfie in the snow. It was fun, but it was too crowded for me. So I climbed up what I believe was six or 700 feet and about a quarter mile. Now I felt like Moses. And I found a rock, and I sat on it nearly an hour, no one bothered to come up that far. And I 
I just existed with God. And God said, it's time. It's time to make your way back. And so I did. I started journeying back. Not, not immediately. I, it was late in the day, so I camped one more night, and the next morning I kind of took off. And You know, we're creatures of habit, and I wanted to go back the way that I came because, well, gosh, it was already so beautiful. But I forced myself to go a different way. Sometimes we have to do that. We have to break out of our habits and routines to see what else God might even have for us in life. And so I took a different mountain pass to get down off the mountains. And I found myself going back through Nebraska and South Dakota. And I found myself going along those train tracks again. Different set of tracks, but the same thing. These narrow tracks with these trains. At one point, I was driving parallel to these trains, and I'm going about 65, and I don't know how fast they're going, but it seemed like it was there at my side forever, for miles and miles. Probably 150 cars. It looked like they were maybe harvesting some wheat or something recently. And I just started thinking about those trains and how it seems like they're slaves to those tracks. I mean, if you think about it, I have a steering wheel in my truck. When I want, I can turn left and I can turn right, but those trains, if you've ever been in an engine, they have speed control, that's it. A steam engine. You can get the fire a little bit hotter to produce, a little bit more steam to go a little bit faster. You can relieve some of that street, some of that steam. You can, you can pull the brake line. Diesel engine, same thing. A little more fuel and you can go a little fast. But it cannot steer to the right or to the left. It's stuck as a slave to those narrow tracks. I kept driving. and I saw this random car, train car at one point, all by itself, flipped over on its side. Apparently it had tried to take a right-hand turn. And there it sat, half destroyed and rusty. And then God spoke. He said, that's life. That's life with me. And that's life without me. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. As I was driving along those railroad tracks, on the way there, on the way back, I have this image that these, these, these trains are slaves to the track. They can't go to the right. They can't go to the left. And yet it's actually those tracks, those rails, that are the very thing that gives it freedom to be able to move anywhere. Those narrow rails. God said, that's life. See what happens when you turn to the right? It leads to destruction. Then overturn the train car. All banged up, bent up, and rusty. They are to be destroyed as weather would have it. But when those trains stay on those rails, it has freedom to go forward like never before. Romans 6, 22 and 23. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. Maybe you know this verse a little bit better. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those trains are slaves to the rails. But the rails that lead that train to life, 
And so many times when we travel through life, sometimes we look at our Christianity as so restrictive. Some of us look at it as a set of rules. Well, I can't do this or I can't do that. Or, or maybe non-believers look at it that way. They're like, well, I, I can't become a Christian because I like doing this and I like doing that. <laughs> they don't realize the destruction that their life is actually being led to. Like a train that goes off the rails. Don, I already know what song you're thinking in your head. Staying on the narrow path. Being a slave to God is actually freedom that leads to eternal life. And you're right. There's no steering wheel to be able to steer to the right or the left. Because when you do, when you force it, you go off the rails and it leads to destruction. Man, those rails go on and on. The places that those trains go, the people that those trains see through all those little towns, those towns of 30 or 38, whatever that population was, those towns of 400, those big towns that eventually rails do lead to. But even a set of railroad tracks eventually has an end, just like this life. And so I ask you, as you are on the rails of life, those narrow rails, are you feeling like you're missing out? Because scripture is clear. If you try and steer to the right or the left, it leads to destruction. But when you stay on the rails, it leads to freedom. It leads to eternal life. And God made that possible through his son, Jesus Christ. Because of three nails. It was intentional. These are always in my office. As a reminder, I know they're railroad spikes. They're not the spikes that Christ got crucified by. But I purposely picked up three for my son. So that he can have the same reminder that I have. Jesus took nails to set us free. Not to bind us to a narrow path that seems like no fun, that makes us feel like maybe we're missing out, but to actually set us free so that we could have eternal life. Jesus Christ died on a cross so that we didn't have to worry about what's off to the right or to the left. To just control that speed as we go around life's corners until we come to the end of our rail, the end of our narrow path. And then there's this great celebration if you have accepted Christ, if you've accepted his way, if you've accepted his narrow path. It's an eternity with a heavenly father that loves you. The same love that we sang about this morning that to some seem reckless, but it's all planned out. Because since the beginning of time, God planned to send his son because he knew the choices that we would make. He knew the desire for us to want to go as a crazy train off the rails. But have you ever seen a train off the rails going anywhere? They stop pretty quickly and are destroyed. But here's the beauty. I don't know why that one, that one car, that one train car stayed there. But it looked pretty mangled like it was probably in the midst of several. And maybe that one was just so damaged that they didn't want to take the time to fix it. But in our life, if we get a little crazy and go off the rails, there's nothing that Christ can't fix. I'm sure that they picked up all those cars and put them back on the rail and they fixed them up and they banged out some of the dents. And 
Christ can do that for you as well. Even if you get a little off the path, he can do that. Because he redeems and he restores. And he's in that fixer up kind of business. So maybe you felt like you're missing out and you've got off the tracks a little bit. Realize that God can bring you back. Just stay on the rails. Maybe you never jumped on the rails to begin with. Give it a try. There's freedom. Or maybe you just needed to have that simple reminder that reminds me as I look at those three nails every day in my office that this was God's plan since the beginning of time to keep us from destruction and to set us free and give us the gift of eternal life. The choice is yours. That's just one of the things that I learned when I was out west. Sometimes we know it up here, but we don't always get it in here. And so I want to spend a few weeks with you just giving you some things that I believe God is helping me with that I hope it will help you with too. Maybe it's something new. Maybe it's just a reminder. It doesn't matter. You know one of the things I thought about when I was out there? There at the retreat center, there was an evening where the rain had finally passed and the sun was coming out. And we were at about 10,000 feet at that retreat center overlooking this giant valley with some mountains behind it. It was so picturesque. And then God made it better. Because he showed a rainbow there that stretched the entire valley. You could see both places this, that this rainbow touched down in the valley. It was absolutely amazing. And you know what this group of pastors came up with? That, that was a reminder. God doesn't need reminders, but he uses reminders. Because every time he looks into the sky and he sees the rainbow, he remembers. It's a reminder. And so maybe that's what these musings from the mountain, that's what I'm going to call this series, and I don't even know how long this series is going to be. Musings means reflection back from my trip on the mountain. And so I hope that you learn something, or maybe you're just reminded of something. And hopefully every week I remind you of how much Christ loves you. And he's in that business of fixing up and redeeming and restoring even when we go a little crazy and get off the rails. Because he just wants to set you free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, thank you. God, thank you for the time that I was able to spend out there God, I needed that, but that's not what this is about. This is about you. And this is about your glory. And this is about the story that you wrote. About your love. And the love that you have for everyone who's here or even at home just listening. God, I pray that what you poured into me would pour out and be effectual on these people here. Like what you have revealed through scripture in new and fresh ways would be reminders to us, would be lessons to us that would help us to desire to follow that narrow path that sets us to freedom and eternal life with you. The God who loves, the God who cares, the God that is just so, so good. We pray this in your son's name, in the holy name of Christ. Amen. Amen.